There are many anime that fall in the category of what I consider to be masterpieces, and all have been able to push anime forward in some way or another, to truly capture something special, whether it's through a psychological process in order to truly understand who you are, or the emotions present that take over you and you don't know how to deal with them. But even though there are many, it never feels like many. It feels like you need to be lucky at times to stumble upon something that isn't just considered a masterpiece, but actually surpasses the expectations you initially held for it. As it happened with me with the Chimera Ant Saga of Hunter x Hunter, or with the last two episodes of Neon Genesis Evangelion. When you are in complete awe of what is shown and suddenly everything makes sense. Suddenly you understand why it's praised so much. Suddenly you realize that you are living a moment that can only be witnessed through a work of art. And to my surprise, I saw an anime last year that might fall in this category. One that completely blew me away. And I remember at the time, I couldn't quite put into words what I felt. I need to spend some time thinking about it, to try and understand why it struck such a strong chord with me. But I realized that thinking about it wasn't going to be enough. I needed to talk about it, to express my thoughts, my emotions, to explain why this show went way beyond my expectations, to explain why the first arc represented in the anime really is something extraordinary. The beginning of a journey. The beginning of Vinland Saga. Before the anime, Vinland Saga was already helmed as a great work of art thanks to its manga that debuted in 2005 and is still ongoing until today. The story starts off with this following a character named Torfin that is seeking revenge. As a young boy, he witnessed his father die because of a man named Ashalad. He was enormously affected by it and swore for revenge and thus decided to follow and even work for Ashelad in order to stay close to him but also to get stronger and to be able to defeat him in a duel one day. This is how Vinland Saga and its first arc begins. But this is really an entryway into a much bigger story and to many other characters that we will eventually meet. One of the aspects that makes the manga so visceral is the artwork done by Makoto Yukimura. There's more of a realistic approach with a non-exaggeration of the characters' features, which of course makes it more seinen, as seinen manga are known to accentuate drama and seriousness through a more detailed and realistic art style. But it also feels part of the era that is set in, as if you're not just reading a manga, but perhaps a history book that pulls you in. Reminiscent in some ways of old history paintings, which is perfect since the manga tells the fictional story mixed with real life events that occurred in 11th century Europe. In fact, most of the characters are based on people that actually did exist during that time. And so the aspect of realism, for the most part, really grounds the story that takes place. But what Yukimura does so well is make it feel like you are going through a storyboard of a film. For those who don't know, a storyboard is when the shots of a film are planned out and laid out in sequential order before the shooting of the scenes takes place. It's a really good way to visualize how you want the film to be told through an imaginary lens before actually using one. And manga many times can have the same stylistic approach as Yukimura had with Vinland Saga. Each page, each moment is not just there to tell us about what's going on, but mostly show us, thanks to the way that movement is portrayed. You can feel each swing of the sword make a massive impact, and you also gain a better understanding of who hit first. For example, in this section in the first chapter, where we see Torfin in action, and since we're reading right to left, the order of things we see are the enemy sword, Torfin, and the enemy that has already been defused. It gives us the idea that Torfin was able to perfectly defuse the enemy before the enemy even had a chance to do anything against Torfin, thus making us see everything that is going on as if we were watching a perfectly shot film. And it's all expressed in just one drawing. And even though my intent is to correlate this with cinema, I would have never had this insight with manga if not for Super High Patch Wolf's video of the genius of Dragon Ball where he really goes into depth with how a mangaka conveys movement. But what amazes me most about Vinland Saga 
is something else. It's the part where you understand that despite the fact that this is set in 11th century Europe, there is a Japanese approach to the story that elevates itself immensely, mainly the philosophy behind many of the characters' decisions. However, many manga fans would have to wait until 14 years later for it to be translated in anime form. Many of them wary if it would be translated correctly. But thanks to Witch Studio, the studio that is also behind Attack on Titan, most of those worries were put to rest. Because for the most part, the first arc that has now been covered in the anime is also top tier. You have the same approach to detail that is brilliantly enhanced thanks to the use of sound. <coughs> You have the same approach to movement by showing us at times all of the movement in one continuous shot, which works incredibly well with a mix of 2D animation and 3D modeling. But you also have the use of color and lighting that just makes it all so beautiful, especially during its most profound moments of the show. And it was here with the anime that it was first introduced to the amazing world of Vinland Saga. Because even though I can truly appreciate what manga can be, truly appreciate the hard work put in by the mangaka, truly appreciate the imagination that goes into visually telling a story through the use of imagery and words, I have the need to see everything through a lens, through a camera, through actual movement and through sound. Whether it's the powerful use of music or something as simple as someone breathing. Because I love cinema. I love watching films that show how a camera is used, that are not just telling a story, but showing it visually, and anime is instrumental in that. Yes, there is no actual camera, but there is an enormous thought process behind it, that pretends that a camera is there to fully show everything that is going on, and anime doesn't shy away from showing us. It focuses on the framing of still shots and the positions of the characters to show us what they are feeling, as Perfect Blue did so well in the bathtub scene. It focuses on the movement of the characters by mixing actual motion with slow motion, almost as if it were a dance of some sort, as Ghost in the Shell did so masterfully in its fight scenes. It focuses on controlling the environment around each character to enhance the danger and tension felt in each scene, but never disregarding how beautiful it can look, as Paprika beautifully showed with the corridor scene. And without anime, we wouldn't have this scene in Requiem for a Dream. Without anime, we wouldn't have the stellar fight scenes in The Matrix. Without anime, we wouldn't have the control of environments as shown in its own corridor scene in Inception. Because anime is cinema, and so is Vinland Saga. But to understand why that is, I need to talk about two moments of the show. Two moments that go beyond what is merely shown on screen. Two moments that made me look at myself. Whether it was a better understanding of life, or just the appreciation of who a character really is at its core. Two moments that show why Vinland Saga is cinema. And to do that, we need to talk about Prince Canute. Prince Canute is a character that is introduced midway through the first arc and we see a character who seems to not belong in the world he is currently in. He wishes not for violence, he wishes not for the responsibility that has bestowed upon him. He is scared of it, scared of having to do something about what is going on around him, and can only really trust the person who has truly cared for him during his life. Not his father, King Swain, but his advisor called Ragnar, an advisor who was in reality his true guardian. Someone who he could trust and would protect him, until one day Ragnar is secretly killed by Ashilad and his men, to force the prince to grow and mature as the man Ashilad wishes he becomes. And it's here where we see Kanut completely lost. He has no one to protect him, he has no one to confide, no one to trust. Until eventually, it seems like the characters that we have been following since the beginning will meet their demise. Torfin seems to get nowhere against Torkel. Ashelad's strategic plans seem to have run its luck. All of his men have betrayed Ashelad in order to save their lives. The journey seems to have come to an end. But when loss seems certain, Prince Kanut finds himself alone talking with a priest. A priest who talks to Kanut about the true meaning of love. And it's here where the show elevates itself. Since the beginning, the music has been really important to convey an ongoing mood throughout, an almost trance-like state that places us within the world. 
that places us in the characters' shoes, that makes us think more and feel more, as if it's all building up to something. And it's none truer than the events that unfold in episode 18, where Prince Canute starts to understand what love really means to the priest, to him, to Christianity, to God. And the music does such a good job to make us not only think about what Canute is thinking, but also feel his thoughts during his moment of epiphany, with incredibly framed shots that bring us closer to Canute and thus to his understanding that love is everything around him, the snow, the sky, the trees, the mountains, the whole world around him that God created. And the only place where that love isn't found is in the hearts of men. I am not religious. I am not a Christian. But what I am is someone who loves to understand the eyes of another. And in this case, understand what Canute really is seeing. So for a moment in time, I was religious. I was a Christian. I was a firm believer in God because this show was able to break the barrier that was in between me and the anime. I became part of it thanks to great character development, thanks to the brilliant use of imagery and a trance-like state that was created thanks to its profound music. I saw everything through Canute's eyes. I found the true meaning of love. I found myself thinking about things I never thought before. I found that it gave me a better understanding of life. I found myself completely immersed in the moment, as if I was the one having an epiphany, and it felt amazing, and reminded me of so many other moments in anime that also made me feel like this, scenes that are able to elevate the experience in such a meaningful way, thanks to its gorgeous visuals, but also through the hypnotic use of its music. And Kanut's Awakening was exactly that. But this isn't the only moment that blew me away, one that involved one of the greatest antagonists ever made, the character known as Ashelad. And this moment comes at the end of the show, when it seems that Ashelad is able to gain exactly what he wanted from King Swain, from the deal that was made between the King and Prince Canute, the King makes an unexpected move the decision to attack Wales in the coming spring in order to prevent any type of rebellion. Ashilad, for a brief instant, is shaken to its core, because Ashilad is someone who plans everything meticulously to achieve exactly what he wants, not driven by emotions, but by his brain. And in this moment, you can see the look of defeat on his face. But more than that, he wishes to fulfill his mom's biggest wish, who was a slave at the hands of Vikings and suffered immensely because of them. His mom wished for King Artorius to come back one day and save the country. But Ashelad knows that in order for things to happen, he has to be the one to take matters into his own hands, and so will do whatever it takes to protect the country where he was born, but now finds himself in a very complicated situation. In a quick attempt, he tries to convince the king not to do so, but the king sneakily whispers in Ashelad's ear for him to choose between Wales or Canute, even mentioning that he knows that Ashelad's mom was a slave. And it's here where everything kicks off. Everything has been building up to this moment, where in an unprecedented course of action, Ashelad confronts the king, insults him in front of everyone, takes out his sword and cuts off his head. What once started as us wanting to see Thorfinn get his revenge against Ashelad, the arc ends with us siding with Ashelad in his quest to save Wales, to see an antagonist become a protagonist, to see a character who we initially hated become someone who we truly feel for. And the way this is shown is extraordinary. The sudden eye movements from Ashelad in response to what the king is saying, the utter silence turn into unnerving music, building up to the sound of the sword cutting through King Swain's neck and again slowly going into utter silence. The exceptional framing used in each moment, especially with the visual metaphor of the crown in the air circling Prince Canute, representing that in this moment Canute has now become the new king which contrasts beautifully with the shocked look that Canute has, which mirrors perfectly what was shown in the manga, and then cutting to a shot of his eyes widening and the blood of his father in between them. Because the truth is, 
no one expected this to happen. And the only way for this to succeed, for Ashila to save both Wiles and Kanut, is for Kanut to take action and be the one to kill Ashilad in front of everyone. Which is exactly what Ashilad intended as soon as he started to insult the king. Our antagonist took matters into his own hands and gave meaning to the name that was given to him by his mother. Because his real name isn't Ashilad, it's Lucius Artorius Castus. He is the real Artorius that his mother waited for so long. And we see him die in this magnificent way. In the end, Ashilad was able to save Wales. This scene has been burnt into my mind. I can still hear the music. I can still see Ashilad's enraged look on his face. I can still see the swipe, the crown in the air, the eyes of Kanut. I can see and hear all of it. Because this scene is incredibly masterful. It's the culmination of one story, of a man who had shown glimpses of this complexity in moments when we were supposed to hate him, in moments where he wasn't joking, he was actually telling the truth, in moments where he did reveal a lot more than we initially thought. Ashilad, as is everyone else in this story, is human, but his death leaves a void in the character who started this story. Thorfinn is now distraught because his life lost its meaning, he was so driven by revenge, but he was never able to see the bigger picture. That Ashilad was not his enemy, but someone who became a father figure for him, and tried to teach Thorfinn what his father wanted him to learn. That a true warrior doesn't need a sword, something that Thorfinn was never able to understand. Ashilad's journey has come to an end, but Thorfinn has yet to find his own path. And that's where the first arc and the first season of the anime ends. This is what anime is able to do, to make us think about what is happening, to make us think about ourselves, to understand why we are in this world, to understand why we are feeling all of these emotions, to find our identity in some way, to find ourselves through all the pain and suffering that is inherent to Japanese culture due to what the country has endured throughout the past 70 years that is felt in almost everything they make. Yes, even one that is based in 11th century Europe. This is the brilliance of anime. As Kanut mentions to God in his moment of awakening, what we lost in exchange for wisdom, the most important thing. It's something that we'll never get back as long as we live. We'll never attain it. Yet, even then, you still tell us to seek it. This resonates so much with me, because I do try to find the true meaning of things even though it always feels like it's an impossible journey. That I do think there is a contradiction with what we as human beings constantly try to do in contrast to the purpose of nature and the world we live in. That the more we try to find the true meaning of love, the further away we are from it. But when I try to seek these greater meanings, there are times when I do feel like I have reached what I have always been searching for, thanks to moments like this one. Thanks to works of art like Vinland Saga that makes me feel more understood, that uses all the means of cinema to not only tell an incredible story, but show it, and is able to impact me deeply. Vinland Saga did that for me, as did every other masterpiece that came before it.